About six years ago, at the ripe age of 17, a friend and I decided that we were going to start a business. It ended up being called Emerald Scales and ran for five years, and until just about today, where it doesn't exist anymore. The employees are gone, the website is gone, and all the animals are gone. There's nothing left of Emerald Scales. So what exactly was Emerald Scales? Well, my friend and I were in the reptile hobby where we would keep exotic animals, and we wanted to make something around this. We loved the idea of working hard on building a project and maybe someday seeing it become self-sustainable. So we had both purchased and talked to and known various reptile breeders, and we saw the improvements that could be made and decided to go for it ourselves and be that improvement in the reptile breeding space. Now, we didn't really have any money. Again, we were 17. <laughs> and um, so we decided that to start not only making some money, but kind of build some rapport and get some clients and get some eyes on what we're doing, we could start by trying to get the cheapest animals possible pretty much. And that was through Craigslist. So anyone that needed to get rid of their animal, uh, we would take for as little money as possible. We didn't want to just flip this animal immediately for a profit because one of the big things we w wanted to do with Emerald Scales was be as like ethical and have the highest standards possible while still making a profit. Because at the end of the day, you have to make money to be able to sustain the animals. And that was, those are our two big goals, was make money and do the best we can for the animals. So we started buying them on Craigslist. And once we made sure that they were as healthy as they could be, we would sell them on the site. And then we were raising up this money to start breeding animals, except we never actually did. As people saw this, they started offering their animals because they couldn't keep them, whether they were going to college or getting married and moving or having a kid or lost interest, um, all sorts of different reasons. We actually ended up focusing on rehoming people's animals and this is what Emerald Scales became. A place where you could send your animal or purchase an animal. And so, yeah, that's, and so Emerald Scales was born. However, Emerald Scales died also <laughs> at a five year lifespan. So in this video, we're gonna talk about um, 100 reasons why it failed. We're gonna start with the management side. This isn't going to all be in chronological order because I think it'll be more structured this way, but uh, it started with just us two. And then we ended up actually hiring people. It was up to three and then up to four, maybe at some point, I think up to five uh, at once, but generally it was between three and four people working on Emerald Scales. Now, I had personally never been hired before. I was 17, I had just dropped out of school, and I was going all in on YouTube along with Emerald Scales at this point, and um, I didn't have life experience or work experience. This is how I was going to get it. But unfortunately, it turns out if you've never been hired, you don't know everything about management. Number two is I had reportedly poor communication skills. Who would have guessed? Someone that didn't have many friends, that had never had a job. <laughs> that had never run a business, didn't really know how to communicate. I did my best and I improved over time, but this definitely threw a wrench in things as well. I also reportedly micromanaged. Also, our, our pay was bad. <laughs> we couldn't offer that much. Uh, pay for everyone that ever worked at Emerald Scales was between nine and $15 an hour. The minimum wage here is $7.25, so it was above minimum wage, and $9 could get you a little bit farther back in 2018 when we launched this, but still, 9 to 15. It's not, it's not great pay. Also, we disagreed on the husbandry of the animals, so we, of course, we have reptiles coming in. Our inventory is living animals. And we, as individuals, have different standards. I would disagree with my friends sometimes. We would disagree with an employee. They would disagree with one of us. It was simply something that added a little bit of tension. We all wanted, we all had the same goal, which was very helpful. We all wanted the animals to thrive as much as they could, and we wanted to get them to that point as quickly as possible. But our ways of doing that were sometimes drastically different, uh, which, you know, is that it do be how it is sometimes. Also, the work hours and workload were very inconsistent, as you could imagine. This is a really weird startup. It's like, there's a lot of different parts to it. Like early on, we'd get like one animal every so often, but then sometimes we get an influx and then sometimes animals would have specific uh, issues that take a lot more time. And so basically part-time employees never seemed quite as dedicated or as motivated to do some of the work and the, and the full-time didn't really work out because we oftentimes just wouldn't have the work for them to do. And so finding the right people for this was definitely difficult. Not to mention, I was just bad at the hiring and interviewing process. 
Uh, we did um, very classic, I guess. I don't know. I still haven't been interviewed for a job. We, <laughs> we would interview people, literally just going to Starbucks um, and doing a classic interview. Like, how are, how's it going? What's your work experience? I don't know. I don't even remember what we asked. It was, it was really about just making sure we got along because that was the biggest thing. It didn't matter if they knew how to do the work because we were there to help them figure it out and we were figuring it out ourselves. So we didn't really know what we needed and it was very interesting, tons of skills gained, but when it comes to Emerald Scales, it wasn't too great for it because hiring people was rough sometimes. We also disagreed on the people buying the reptiles. So that there were two main big components to Emerald Scales. That was the service side and the um, product side. The service was rehoming your animal, the product was buying an animal. And uh, the comparison I'm going to use a lot and I always use is a used car dealership. It's kind of like what they do. They have to buy cars for their inventory. They can't just make their inventory. They have to get it from other people. They pay them for the cars. They fix up the cars, make sure they're good, and then they sell them to someone else. But as you, we will learn, and as you can probably guess, living animals and emerald scales is still kind of different from used cars. But this is the best comparison because there's these two sides and on the buying side, we didn't want to just sell them to anyone like most sellers do. We also wanted to add this level of verification so that we knew the animal was going to a good home, basically. Um, kind of like like an just an adoption thing, sort of, but an actual sale. Uh, but it wasn't just us that were verifying enclosures and verifying people buying the animals. We oftentimes disagreed within like the management itself on which people should and should not be approved for an animal. And this wasn't always consistent. It's not like there was one person that always had lower standards than the other. It would, it would oftentimes be different answers from different people for different species. And uh, it got kind of crazy. So, and also I realized I hate managing people. I don't like being a manager. I hate having people rely on me. It's kind of stressful. I'm, I'm becoming a more social person, but especially back in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, 2020, I was even less social, not to mention actually having to manage people like with, yeah, I don't, I'm a bad manager. I don't like managing. So that's the management section of why Emerald Scales failed. Uh, let's go ahead to the housing. So the housing for Emerald Scales changed a lot over time. Early on, I was 17. I was living with my parents until I was 19. And so Emerald Scales was part of my bedroom. It was just my bed, my desk, my and Emerald Scales over on the other wall. Also, I forgot to mention, you can just follow along with all this. That I have a playlist in the description called 100 Emerald Scales Videos, and it is 100 videos documenting Emerald Scales. There's more than 100 videos on it, but I picked the 100 most relevant. There's also breakdowns of the finances, how much we made every month from launch to the end of Emerald Scales, so you can watch those breakdowns as well. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot in the description, but I'm trying to fill in the gaps if you don't know much about it or anything about it. And so the housing, it was, yeah, just my bedroom and my friend's bedroom. We each had a couple animals, and but eventually these rooms definitely uh, filled up quite a bit. And I ended up renting a townhouse to live in, like moving out of my parents. However, the majority of the house, almost all of it became space for Emerald Scales. I couldn't lease an office. I couldn't lease much of anything. Not only were the prices too high and the leases were too long, it's normally three to five years for these offices that were around me, but also this would be additional rent on top of my own rent and I just couldn't get any landlords to approve of it. So I gave up on the offices and just was like, okay, I'll just rent a place to live and then do Emerald Scales out of my house. I contacted over, well over 50 landlords and different properties, only three of them approved of what I was doing. I was like pretty honest. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have some animals. They're like, they're super clean. Like I, I would give them a rundown, but I minimized it. Like, oh, it'll just be like maybe a dozen reptiles at most. And I gave them like honest stuff about like, they're clean, they, they're not gonna damage the property. No one's gonna hear them. They're not dangerous, they're not venomous. But only three <laughs> said, okay, that's fine. One, however, ended up backing out. One was a very disgusting, dingy property in a pretty sketchy area. And then one was the one that I ended up renting. Uh, it was a very sad little townhouse in a not great part of town. And um, it, I mean, for reference, the, the value of the home was $80,000, which is not very much for a house. It was, it was, a, it was, it was something. Um, however, the next reason is <sighs> there were constant feuds with neighbors. It was insane because word started getting around that there were reptiles and that the weird kids 
townhouse and they didn't like that. And this escalated over time, it was gradual. I never escalated anything. I always tried to avoid confrontation, but they started getting grumpy and frustrated to the point that there were literal daily shouting matches. I never knew I would get in a shouting match with someone, but it was literally me shouting with neighbors every day because they'd be walking around the property. They'd be looking through our windows. And of course, they had to start calling the police on us and reporting us. And um, it was not epic. This housing experience really put a damper in things. And so eventually I, was renting a second home and this townhouse became just emerald scales for a little bit like half a year or something but we were constantly next reason having to hide everything if we were bringing a new ant like a, oh we're bringing a boa and we better not let the neighbors like it it was all so secret and this was a townhouse so it's not like it's a private separated property um it, p employees coming over to the house we were having to like hide this up like okay if anyone talks to you you're our friend you're just hanging out maybe like you it, uh, it was we had to like have this like second life and hide everything and it just added this extra stress we also needed some serious electricity and climate control and amenities for all of these animals because as we grew from five in our room we then eventually had 10 and then 15 20 50 sometimes 75 plus animals uh, it, it takes a serious setup and we didn't always have that setup available uh, even just the electric bill was oftentimes over $500 a month and um, it was probably not up to f safety code <laughs> with the amount of uh, extension cords and extension cords and power strips and power strips and power strips and we needed lots of rooms and sections this is the next reason and this was difficult to achieve because when you bring new animals in you don't want them just commingling with the others immediately you want to keep them separate and quarantine them and so trying to separate these spaces was very difficult in this townhome but it was kind of the best that we had so uh, let's go ahead and move on to the intake section of things the animals actually being taken in by emerald scales and everything that that entailed so you need to get rid of your reptile maybe you're slightly incentivized to lie or you don't actually know that there's honestly a problem with your animal and people were constantly misleading us with the condition of the animals uh, over the time of emerald scales we had over 600 animals in the five years and i don't know maybe over half were in the condition that we expected there were so many surprises sometimes it was clearly them misleading us whether they send an old picture send a fake picture send an edited picture we would have them like include a paper with their order number and their name on it and all this but they could still take it at the right angles to cover things up or they simply didn't know that the animal had certain issues and this was a huge problem because it added so much unexpected time uh, it, it required so much unexpected time, resources, energy, money, uh, just everything, and just stress into some of these animals that we did not expect. We also had a lot of trouble sourcing animals early on. This is proof this is not chronological, going way back to 2017 and 18. Like I said, we can't just create our inventory. We can't just drop ship more reptiles. We can't just breed them on the spot. We didn't even want to breed them at this point. We had an issue where there was more demand for people to buy animals than there was for us to actually get animals. And this was a very rough, long start. Made a lot of people frustrated because they were waiting so long to see an animal they want. And also it just took a ton of time. Like I said, Craigslist is how we were sourcing them. And also Facebook Marketplace, OfferUp, LetGo, um, Nextdoor, just like every, every app that someone might be listing a reptile on, we were all over them. And we spent days and days just contacting people. We contacted probably so many thousands of listings and we met up with so many hundreds of people and lots of them would flake, not show up, mislead us on the animal. And it was extremely hard to source these animals. Also, people changed their mind. Actually, like they, they, uh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't get rid of it. I think I'm gonna hold on to it. Except they tell us this after we've gone through a very lengthy process. Most of these animals were being shipped in to us in the mail. And so that takes a while. It's also very expensive. We have to buy the shipping supplies, send them the shipping supplies, put together those shipping supply kits that we sent them, send them the shipping labels, which are also expensive. And this was all being done by customer support people who were getting paid hourly we go through this whole process and we spend money on the animals setup on the specialty things that the animal's going to need that we predict and everything that that entails the paying the person to set up this enclosure and then oh i'm not going to send it actually or oh it died before i could send it so 
Uh, and to speak, speaking of animals dying, people would mispack animals a lot. We, we tried so hard to be as specific as possible on how to safely pack your animal for shipping. We, they got video instructions, they got written instructions, we answered questions. Uh, we, like, I don't know what else there is to do. It's just putting an animal in a box properly, but you might just be like, well, is shipping just dangerous? Well, when we shipped animals out, there was a 1% chance it was going to die. One out of 100 animals would not survive being shipped out. So you can do the math, we, it was like 600 animals we sold. We had about six dead on arrivals to customers. When shipping in, it was 10%. One out of every 10 animals would not survive. Not only was this because that they were, were somehow mispacking them, even though we were always refining the process and making it as safe as possible, uh, there were also health conditions that people would either not know about or cover up, and that would result in the animal dying while being shipped in. So, Also, people's scheduling expectations were very unrealistic. Uh, this is both on the general, when can I send my animal, and also, what day and time can I send my animal. Uh, so we had a wait list. We didn't want to take more in than we could handle at any given time. So you'd have to wait for a certain period of time. Sometimes this was two to three weeks. Other times this was two to three months. At one point it was well over a year you would have to wait to send an animal. While that's not our fault, it's also not their fault that they need to do it sooner. So we would make as many exceptions as we could, especially since uh, they are paying to send us these animals. It was a service where Early on, we would actually pay them some, and then we would just cover shipping, and then it was free, and we'd cover the expenses, and then they would actually have to cover shipping, and then they had to pay us a fee on top, and then an even higher fee, and so we relied on this revenue, and we needed people to send us animals to pay for everything, because, yeah, they were paying for that whole process, but, uh, well, we'd have to refund people that ended up changing their mind, and also, yeah, the scheduling was an issue, so if it didn't work out, it's, oh, this isn't gonna work, and now we have to refund them, and we already paid for all this other stuff, so. Um, but yeah, we relied on people sending animals to keep stock. So this is another good comparison to the car used car dealership. You can offer more money, like you can check Carvana and see how much they're willing to pay you, and it might go up sometimes because they're more desperate for inventory or the price of stuff goes up. We can't try and pressure someone to get rid of their animal, like their beloved pet, like, oh, I think you should do it. We're having a discount. You can send it to us just for this much. <laughs> we can't do that. It needs to be people that only really have to send the animals because that's a big thing to get rid of a pet that you care about and have invested a lot into. And so <laughs> uh, it would it would suck when we don't have inventory, but we we can't really do much about it other than spreading the word that hey we're a place that can take them. So that comes into the marketing, which we'll get in later. We're getting into a lot of things later. There's a lot on this list. Animals took a really long time to be ready to be sold as well. I believe in most businesses, you want your inventory to sit on the shelves as short as possible, and ours sat on shelves for a very long time. The average animal, I think, would stay for maybe two months, like six weeks, six to eight weeks on average, but there were many animals that would end up staying with us for over a year, Some, a couple even over two years to get to a place where we were comfortable selling it to somebody else. This was either like a ball python who had serious feeding issues, or a leopard gecko that had serious health problems, or a bearded dragon that had serious bone issues and deficiencies that we were trying to fix the best we could. Our animals were sitting here for months and years, and this took a lot of time, and it was kind of a pain. You, I mean, it's self-explanatory. I don't need to explain that. And also, it was not easy to do local business and local work. We didn't have a storefront like people thought. We tried to meet up with people as much as we could. We did many local meets, but it's like you have to send someone out to do that. And if you're paying them even just a measly 10 bucks an hour, that's like 20 bucks to send someone out to go pick up an animal. And that's assuming the person shows up and the animal's in the condition you expect. And so that just added even more. And we did try and keep it up as much as we could because ultimately it is much safer to not ship the animal, but uh, it was not easy to do that local stuff for sure. Same with sale, local sales. Uh, it's it's hard to find that time versus if we sell like five animals one week, we can ship them all out at the same time, same day, same FedEx trip uh, versus five people locally. Uh, they're all in different spots. They all want to meet at different times. It's much more difficult. Also, the laws over these six or so years, five or six years, became more strict. The regulation increased. We could work with fewer species of animals. And um, that was not fun. <laughs> like it, it sucks to have this constant stress of, well, what are we, 
okay, what are we going to do with these people that want to send it or whatever? We had a couple workarounds, which we'll also get into later, but more strict laws was not epic. Also, we did not decline enough animals. This was a mistake on my part for sure, and I kept making exceptions. I couldn't help myself. I just wanted to try and help them out. This was not totally altruistic. I also wanted the revenue because we needed the revenue from the intakes. And so I really didn't want to decline animals. And ultimately, I should have had a higher bar of, okay, that's past the health of where we're going to take it. Um, or, okay, we have too many. We should just not accept any more right now. The flip side that I kept telling myself is, okay, if I don't take it, it's most likely going to die. This is either because they told us it's going to die because they're not going to do anything about it. They're just going to let it die or because they can't afford to bring it to a vet or they can't afford to care for it any longer. They don't have the time to, to feed it. I don't know. Uh, they had lots of various excuses. I think some were justified, some were not. And so I felt this extra pressure to accept as many as possible and as many conditions as there is, and that was a big mistake. If I went back, I would not. I would have a higher bar and just be like, it's out of my hands. I, I can't worry about it. It might die, but it's not ours and it's not our responsibility. So yeah, but that's that was a mistake. So also people wouldn't send the reptiles to anyone else. <laughs> they would just wanted it to come to me, like me, like me, Alex specifically. I was often put on this pedestal where Oh, it's Alex doing it. He's gonna like he's gonna magically fix everything and he's gonna be the best person for the animal. I appreciate that. That was really nice. But the people that I trust were just as good, if not better. Those are people working with me and people that I could trust, like, okay, we're full, how about this person? And they and people most of the time would only want to send them to me. Like they can visualize the specific individual guy that's gonna be working with their animal. And um, so that it, it made things more, it was nice. It was, I appreciated it, but it did make things more difficult. And also people's timing didn't align with our available openings. This is kind of a repeat, I guess, but not only would they not be able to wait for a few months, but maybe they can't get to FedEx that specific day when we specifically have an open spot in the house for that we can take their animal. And also it was based on the weather and time of year. And so these opening timings oftentimes were missed or people would just like, not real like we would tell them your FedEx closes at 8 p.m. They show up to FedEx at 8, 10 p.m. And then they can't ship it to us. This adds a lot more time because not only do we have to reschedule it all and re-prepare when we're gonna take the animal, but also we'd have to re-ship them shipping supplies. Some of the supplies cannot be reused. And next up, let's go to the shipping. Actually like focus on the shipping process. Shipping is limited uh, to a few months per year with reptiles, and that is very unique to most other things. I used to sell a lot of merchandise. I still do sometimes, and I never thought about it. I print the hoodie, I put it in a bag, it goes off to your house. That's it. But with reptiles, we're in North Carolina, so we can't ship during the highest, hottest points of the summer or the coldest points of the winter. So we would be limited to a few months in spring and a few months in fall it's also based on holidays as well and within those few months we were only limited to a couple days out of each week so we have to take into the other person's weather into account also <laughs> and we can only ship a few days a week at the end shipping became more dangerous and so we were limited to instead of shipping monday through thursday we ended up just shipping tuesday and wednesday so two days out of seven days out of a few months of 12 months was the only time we could ship and we completely 100% relied on shipping animals. And this is not unique to us. This is anyone selling living animals. So yeah. Also shipping is limited to good weather in both locations. So, okay, we have, we have Tuesday and Wednesday of these months of these weeks. Also, we have to check the weather at our location and the delivery address location. And sometimes we would check the FedEx hub that it's gonna stop at location because we had a couple issues there where, oh, well, it's it's pretty warm in North Carolina. It's pretty cold in California, but oh, it's stopping at that Tennessee hub where it's too cold. That's a problem too. So you're so reliant on just totally out of your hands, just whatever the weather is up to. And even the perfect shipping preparations sometimes just went wrong. There were things, like the weather, there were things that were out of our hands. Even if no mistakes were made, there was a mistake made along the way, be it by FedEx or by the, I, I mean, I guess by FedEx, <laughs> like, even if it's not a mistake there, just things go wrong. You are shipping live organisms in boxes, and so there is that risk. Uh, and um, 
you just couldn't avoid it sometimes. Also, the price of shipping increased a lot. When we started Emerald Scales, the average shipping label was just under $60 each, which is kind of a lot for a shipping label, but it is what it is. But at the end of the five years of Emerald Scales, the average shipping label was $110. It doubled, basically the price to ship not include this is not does not include the shipping supplies either which is 10 to 20 sometimes 30 dollars just for that it's just it sucked that shipping increased as everything has increased in price shipping was not immune to that especially not overnight shipping not to mention oh here's one i didn't even write down overnight shipping kind of became not overnight anymore it became almost a given at a certain point that it was going to take two maybe even three days and also people <laughs> People refuse to pick up from hubs for some reason. You can, basically, you can overnight deliver to an address or a FedEx hub. It is safer to do the FedEx hub that saves one truck that the animal won't have to be on. And you don't have to worry about the weather that the truck experiences or how the person handling the package handles it because it's one less, one fewer person handling that package. But almost everyone that we asked, hey, we're gonna ship to this hub can you go there on this day? They're like, nope, I don't have a car. I don't have a driver's license. I don't have anyone to drive me. I don't want to, <laughs> it's too far. Most people just like forced us to ship to their house. And then people just wouldn't even be home anyway, even though they were supposed to be. So uh, the dead on arrivals increased over time. We had one dead on arrival early on and we went super long without any, but then as the years progressed, it was more and more frequent that these dead on arrivals were happening, which was scary and not ideal. So there's a shame that so, just some, just a little scratch on the surface of the shipping problems and shipping issues. Now the animal's here. All right, the animal's arrived. It's safe and sound. Great. Well, our inventory is alive. <laughs> Back to the used car dealership. You buy all those cars, they sit in your lot. You don't really want cars to sit for too long. You should run them. You should make sure that they're like, right, their batteries don't die or whatever. You want their oils flowing, but it's not an animal that you have to feed and water and clean every single day, plus any medical concerns, plus individualized care. Plus we wanted to do our best to make sure every animal was as handleable as possible. We didn't like selling a de very defensive ball python. We wanted it to be at least comfortable with handling. And so this all took daily, like our inventory, which should just be sitting there for most businesses, takes constant everything, constant resources. And each animal had different requirements because we weren't just breeding ball pythons. We were accepting such unique cases of animals. As you can see in the videos, there's so many unique cases. It was cool and all, but also, man, that really sucked a lot. <laughs> Every animal had different, required different enclosure, different temperatures, different humidity, different setup, different diet, different medical problems, different personalities that like to be fed. Diff oh, this one likes to be tongue fed. This one likes to eat out of a bowl. This one likes mealworms. This one likes dubia roaches. It was so, so much. Every animal was so different and we have 75 of them <laughs> because we need a lot so that we can make enough revenue to sustain everything because this was not cheap believe it or not. And animals are good at hiding issues. If you show an issue that shows you're vulnerable and you don't want to be vulnerable because then you die, that's uh, existence. And animals were good at hiding issues. And even if it looked like an animal was fine when it came, it could have been covering something up that we discover later, or they just develop issues because animals do that. Organisms do that. Sometimes problems happen just out of nowhere. <laughs> Single issues could take hours sometimes. Like I remember, with my first assistant, she'd be working eight, sometimes nine, 10 hours a day. And it's like, okay, I'm going home now. I've been here for nine and a half hours. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, but you've hardly done anything. And she's like, well, yes, but that's because, you know, we got that leopard gecko in, it was shipped with stuck shed on all 10, on all 20 of its toes. And so I sat there for two hours with tweezers trying to carefully do it. And it kept biting me and now I'm covered in blood because I was <laughs> ripping at my fingers while I was doing it. And then Stan, your bearded dragon, you know, he has that femoral pore issue. So I spent 45 minutes on that. And then that ball python that has to be assist fed, I wanted to do that properly and carefully. So that took an extra 30 minutes. And so it's like just a few specialized animals could take up an entire work day. And if I'm paying like 12 bucks an hour what is that plus overtime or whatever just i don't know about that's like 100 bucks basically paying for just a couple animals to be cared for and that's just the surface what about all the other animals that need everything so yeah issues were an issue 
And also, vets, exotic vets. I don't feel like talking about them, but we're gonna do this quickly. I don't like exotic vets. I never got along with exotic vets. I, ex I witnessed and experienced a lot of malpractice with exotic vets. They were expensive. They were hard to work with. We just don't get along as people. We would disagree on what the animals needed, but we relied on them. They were a necessary evil because I don't have an x-ray machine. I can't do blood work. I can't legally prescribe stuff to animals. I'm not a vet. Many people said, oh, you should go like, get your vet license so you can do it. No, I would be a terrible vet too. I'm not saying I could do any better. It's a hard job. They have the highest suicide rate, whatever. Doesn't mean I like them just because they're killing themselves. <laughs> what does that change? I did not have good experiences with them and they were also expensive. So even when they did what we needed, it's like, whoops, there goes two, three, four hundred dollars for a single animal that we're going to make less than a hundred on or whatever. Mites and ticks, mostly mites in our case. Mites are everywhere. And um, it was pretty much just expected that an animal's gonna come in with mites. Thankfully, we never shipped an animal off with mites, but man, was it stressful. It was so stressful. <laughs> it was so scary shipping never. It's like, ah, I know it's been clear of mites for two months. Like if an animal had mites, we would wait months just to make sure they don't come back. We didn't miss an egg. We did a good job, but Man, were those mites a pain. And man, was that a lot of mite product, just hundreds of dollars just in various mite sprays and keeping them from spreading is hard, believe it or not. Thankfully, again, we did a good job, but that was not easy. And also like 10% of the animals took like 90% of the time. We're not a used car dealership. Oops, we bought a lemon. The animal go gets, <laughs> the, the car go gets crushed. We just junk it, goes to the junkyard. We sell it for parts. I can't sell a bearded dragon for parts. I'm stuck with it. It's my responsibility now. I took this animal on. Whatever problems it has, we have to see them out till the end. And that sucked. And man, did that take a lot of time. And also, this is this is a mistake on our part. We totally failed to keep up the documentation. Early on with Emerald Scales, we had these super detailed, long Google documents that everyone had access to. Each animal had its own. It had the day it came in, the birth date that we, if we know it, even the name of the animal the feeding schedule, what it ate, how much it ate, how it's looking, every single little detail, like a personal uh, medical chart with its weight and its length. We totally just failed at keeping this up because it took so much time and we got super disorganized. So if I could go back, I would get one person whose only job is keeping up with the documentation of the animals because I think that would have made a difference. But we didn't do that. That was a mistake and it made things worse. Also, not, every, not everyone knew what animals were even here every day because it was changing so often and there were so many scheduling changes and unexpected things where every single day it's like, what is that animal? I didn't know we had fat tail geckos in. Where did they come from? I didn't know we had another bearded dragon come in. Is that the same beardy from last week or is that a new beardy? Oh, that's a new beardy? Okay, so I just... Uh, uh, uh. Uh, it changed too fast and it's like oh where did that animal go oh that one got shipped off oh where did that animal go oh that one died <laughs> uh, we also took in large sums of animals at once versus a couple at a time it would have been nice if just every day okay there's two new animals a day versus okay there's 10 new animals today and then nothing new for eight days uh this was because of scheduling with weather like every day is not safe except for this one day so everyone ships the same day and we have this huge influx of animals of all different conditions and species and hopefully one doesn't have mites and like because i mean stuff can spread within fedex as well so because mites are quick and also um because of unboxing videos unboxing videos were the true bread and butter of emerald scales this is what was keeping it going because the revenue from unboxing videos and the attention is what made emerald scales have any amount of success. And to do with these unboxing videos, I can't just unbox one animal. I need 20 or 30. So I would try to bundle them up all on the same day. In the later unboxing videos, I ended up just splicing them together. So it was like five animals a day, three or four days in a row. And I would just edit it to look like they all came on the same day. But early on, yeah, it was genuinely all, all the animals came in the same day. And I loved making the unboxing videos, but oh man, the moment that camera turned off, it was like, what have I done? There's animals everywhere. <laughs> Why did I do this again? And, um, but I had to because like, yeah, that was how Emerald Scales was funded. So let's actually go to marketing and logistics next. The biggest way we got eyeballs on Emerald Scales was YouTube videos. The second biggest, sometimes actually the biggest for a while, early on especially, was Instagram, where I got banned. I got banned from Instagram. <laughs> 
because they enforced a rule where you can't sell exotic animals on Instagram. That's the rule. But ironically, Instagram made money off Emerald Scales too because we would promote uh, posts. We would advertise on Instagram. We'd actually pay for ads. And so like if an animal wasn't selling for like a month, we would just do like a $20 Instagram ad and it would usually sell. We lost this. I felt like we diversified decently, but we could have done a lot better with the marketing itself. And this is just very unexpected and, and threw another wrench in things. We've got like 28 wrenches in this <laughs> machine so far. And also uh, businesses exist to separate people from their money. That's the whole point. <laughs> uh, businesses will do this however means necessary. But unfortunately for a living pet, A, nobody needs it. <laughs> it's, it's a want, it's a luxury sort of thing. And B, the people that want it can't necessarily afford it. So what can you do? You can do things to convince people to buy things they can't afford anyway, but you don't want to do that with a living animal because you want them to be able to afford it for the duration of the animal's life. And also, even if you want and afford it, that's still not enough because we wanted to make sure that they were actually an appropriate home. So marketing was like, we want as many people shopping on Animal Scales as possible, but also we're going to gatekeep you as well. <laughs> so nobody likes being gatekeeped. Imagine getting gatekeeped by a company where you want to buy the thing and they don't let you. It's like we went like full on Ferrari. <laughs> Speaking of exotics, exotic animals get categorized under the same group as drugs, alcohol, gambling, firearms, and adult content. I don't know why, but that's just how it is. And so because of this, we would have to follow the same rules that, that someone selling drugs or alcohol would, which is pain. We would get banned and denied from payment processors and from certain online services that we wanted to use simply because it was animals. I couldn't even use FreshBooks. <laughs> FreshBooks denied me. <laughs> I couldn't use Wix. Uh, Wix denied me to like the payment processor. Like these big services were like, sorry, that goes under gambling and guns. So you can't, <laughs> come on, really? It, like, you know how like, if you wanna buy some of these things, you have to buy it with crypto or something. That's what we basically were like on track of having to do. And our inventory, this is marketing still, was ran random and inconsistent. We didn't know what we were getting. So we couldn't even predict what we're gonna market to people. We couldn't predict what was gonna be sold. We couldn't do like pre-orders or anything. It was just, oh, here's what we've got. Do you want it? Oh, this isn't what you want? Okay. And so people, to this day, once a month still, I get emails saying, when are rough green snakes back in stock? Because one time we had rough green snakes in stock because somebody captive bred them, couldn't keep them, and gave them to us. We listed them, we sold them. Never again did we get rough green snakes. But because Emerald Skills was known as the rough green snake seller, still in 2023, people are asking to buy rough green snakes. It was totally unpredictable, constantly. It was, it was so weird. Also, we can only sell to the contiguous USA. Uh, that's just all of the United States, but Alaska and Hawaii and not Puerto Rico either. And only about 60 something percent of you are in the United States. So immediately, almost half of you weren't even eligible to be a customer, uh, unlike merchandise and stuff. And also, I can't mislead people on animal sales. I mean, I could, but that would not be very good. Let's go back to the used car dealership. You've got, oh, look at this. Look at this real nice Toyota right here. I'm, don't, don't try to roll down the rear back window though. And don't, uh, don't go over 55 and don't shift it in the fifth gear. It's, uh, it might sound a little funny and don't check if the AC is working. Like you can sell a car and lie about it. That's what they do. They want to cover up the problems. I've had it happen to me where I, what? Well, with the car that I currently have and also uh, with cars that I almost bought, like like when I was looking at used cars in like 2019, I knew the car so well because I was such an enthusiast of it that I knew the things to check and he was trying to cover them. Like we've all experienced it. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Um, this isn't meant for me to complain about used car dealerships, but they get like this kind of pass to do it, but we can't. Oh, it, uh, this animal has this debilitating life altering issue well i have to disclose that of course and this animal we don't know how old it is like we have to be honest because that's just the right thing to do there and unfortunately honesty was a downside <laughs> being honest made sales harder what can i say that's just how it is also our customer service was extremely slow and always behind emerald scales objectively had bad customer service just thousands and thousands and thousands of inquiries and email threads and and pictures and conversations <laughs> but just a couple people at, at one point just one person 
doing the emails. It was insane. And so this looked really bad on us because we were super slow to respond and inconsistent with responses. And so people were just unhappy with us there. Also, people believed that we were a nonprofit. Some people were upset to learn that we weren't, and um, others just felt misled because Emerald Scales was oftentimes known as a nonprofit. Never once did I call it a nonprofit. It never was a nonprofit, but it just online, the idea that it was a nonprofit was a big thing, and so people felt upset when they learned, oh, it's not a nonprofit. I have a whole video about why Emerald Scales was not a nonprofit if you wanna watch that. And like I said, above Instagram, unboxing videos were the biggest way that we got sales and got eyes on Emerald Scales. Well, they became less popular over time. It was a series on YouTube, and like any series, the interest tapers off oftentimes. Uh, the first few unboxings have over 2 million views each. The next little batch of unboxings had a million views each, which is still really good. And then the unboxings after that had 500,000 and then 300,000 views each. Still insane view counts on these videos, but that was noticeably not enough, not only to get enough eyes, but also the revenue from the videos. This is gonna sound ridiculous, but just bear with me, okay? The, the last unboxing video only made $5,000. If you ever, t the fact that I made five grand on a YouTube video is insanity, but unfortunately, this was still not enough to sustain Emerald Scales. These videos needed to make over 10 grand each just to try and cover the expenses of Emerald Scales. It's, it's so crazy. Like I love how successful these videos were, but the fact that like <laughs> Emerald Scales was expensive and unfortunately five grand just wasn't cutting it. And so as the unboxing videos became less popular, things became more difficult. Also, Go Herping and Emerald Scales were one and the same to many people. Totally understandably, it's not their fault. To me, they're very different. I see Go Herping as my personal online persona, my online like little personal brand that I can just do whatever under. And I saw Emerald Scales as a separate project that's building on its own. But to most people, I am Alex Green, I am Go Herping, I am Emerald Scales. And I, I get it, we made tons of Emerald Scales content on the channel, and I was in pretty much all of it. So of course, people are gonna think that. Uh, this made caused issues, one, because my reputation is directly linked to Emerald Scales' reputation. So if I say something controversial, if I get canceled again, whatever, this directly impacted Emerald Scales, which was not good. And so yeah, we should have probably, I don't know, I guess we should have marketed more third-party ways and not have my face so linked to it. But then again, that person, that personal connection also probably helped a lot. And finally, in the marketing and sale, or marketing and logistics section of this, um, I likely never would have been able to step away, uh, even if it became self-sustainable. The goal for Emerald Scales, the first goal, it's fine to change goals, I think, but our goal, I think, was good. Within five years, we have a clear, like, after five years, we should have a clear path to self-sustainability, where we can step back, still own Emerald Scales, but not doing hands-on work and making a profit from it. This, even if it happened, would have been really hard because if people see that I step away, that was a big reason people were sending their animals or buying animals because it was, in their eyes, me directly doing everything. And uh, it, it was upsetting people to learn that I was becoming more hands-off and outsourcing more of the work and stuff. So Next up, let's talk about sales and revenue. People are only going to pay so much for a product, no matter what it is. You're not going to go to a used car dealership and pay more for a 2012 Toyota Corolla than you are to go to Toyota and buy a brand new one. Why would you? Why would anyone do that? <laughs> but that's what Emerald Scales is doing. We were selling animals in in more questionable condition with less information than a breeder selling a new, like a fresh, fresh batch <laughs> of animals. There are differences here. A lot of people like knowing that they're not just giving money to a breeder that's producing more animals. It is giving an animal a new home that needed one and that has a more unique history i guess okay one way you could put i like coins and stuff i like like silver i prefer older um paper money and older silver and stuff that has like history to it and that is maybe more scarce versus just buying a brand new off the press silver coin so i i get that there's a difference there but ultimately i am only going to pay so much for that old silver at the end of the day and long story short not many people want to pay $250 for a normal male ball python, <laughs> but sometimes we were selling normal ball pythons for over $200, which are literally worthless. And when I say worthless, I mean financially. The animal has worth, I understand, and I think that you get what I'm saying. Factually, male, like 
Normal male ball pythons, or normal ball pythons in general, they're literally used as feeder animals for other animals. <laughs> Any batch of ball pythons, you're pretty much gonna get some normals, and there's too many normals. And so they get sold, and they're, they're like fed to venomous snakes and stuff. And so I can't really compete with that, but we're oftentimes, almost always getting normal male ball pythons in. Realistically, um, for animal scales to have kept working, <laughs> Uh, I think it would have needed to cost like 500 to send an animal and like 500 to sell an animal, like to actually realistically make it work just through this. But people aren't gonna do that. I mean, some will, but not many. And even the expensive animals we were selling, like, oh, we've got this nice $500 blue-eyed leucistic or this nice Leechianus gecko that's $1,000. There's no genetic guarantee. There's no background information. We don't know the age for sure. We can't guarantee the, like, how it was cared for. We don't know how it was cared for. We don't know what it went through. We don't know where it came from. So many questions and so many unknowns. I guess let's go to used car dealership. You, you can't Carfax the reptile we're selling. You can't look it up. You can't pay that $20 report and see what the VIN says. It doesn't exist. It's all a mystery. And so especially with expensive animals, like most people buying expensive animals, not most, but a lot, are buying them to breed them. And while we weren't anti-breeding, like, yeah, you could breed an animal that we sold, that alone really upset people, knowing that we would willingly sell to someone that's going to breed it. But that didn't mean we lowered the standards on the setup. We weren't accepting, like, little tiny racks or whatever, uh, where it's just going to sit, like, and not move the rest of its life. It needed to be a full, nice setup and everything, but we were okay with people breeding the animals, because we kind of had to be. We needed that, those big sums of money from these expensive morphs and stuff to pay for this. And it was, we were lucky to find people that were willing to pay that since there was so little known about the animals. So, yeah. And also the majority of the revenue for Emerald Scales was actually from taking in an animal. Because at one point it was like $250, $240 to send a reptile. And uh, we were making more on the intake than actually selling the animal. So this incentivized us to take in more animals because we were making more from the intake. Like we would rather charge more for someone to send an animal and then sell it for less if it meant getting it out quicker than trying to sell the animal for more. Um, and this is gonna sound bad, but it just is how it is. People are more desperate to send an animal than they are to buy an animal. So the only way to keep doing this is we had to take advantage of the desperation and charge them more. I know it sounds bad, but that's just, I don't know. Yeah, that's how it is. Nobody has to buy a reptile, but people do have to get rid of their reptile, and so they're gonna pay more. And uh, yeah, so that was just kind of, it was weird, it felt weird, but it's just how it was. And like I said, most of the income was from YouTube. You know, the only thing that's more volatile than Emerald Scales is YouTube. That was some volatile, or still is volatile income for me. YouTube is still my job, and it is crazy up and down, it's, it's insane. Uh, sometimes you'll have a great year, and then a terrible year, and then a good month, and a bad month, and a good week, and a bad week. Uh, some months I was making 20% of what I made the month before and then I'd make double that and this was the other source of income that everything was reliant on so it was just all so all over the place and we couldn't sell at reptile shows we used to but I ended up regretting that I have a video on reptile shows um, like I said we had this whole thing where we want to make sure the animal is going to a good place you can't do that at a reptile show in fact most sales I would argue at reptile shows are impulse buys <laughs> And so you're selling animals to people on a whim. Some of these people have never even seen a snake in person. They just wander from the street and they're like, oh, reptile show. And then whoop, here's some money. I'll take your animal. We don't know. We don't even have their contact information. Sometimes people just pay cash and then they're gone with the animal. It was a bad idea and I'm glad we stopped early on. But uh, reptile shows are a big way many breeders and sellers make money from reptiles because you can take advantage of these impulse buys. You can persuade them, you can be a salesman, you can talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, eye to eye, face to face, and get their money and get these big sums of money in just a couple days. And we just couldn't morally do that anymore. Like basically as someone that's made a, a big part of my income on merchandise, uh, taking advantage of, of impulse sales is just a huge thing. Like. Limited time, 24 hour sale, while supplies last, limited edition. That's what really makes the money there. And I do it all the time too. I, I, I get merchandise that is limited time and I don't know how many are left and I wanna get one and I impulse buy it and I usually don't regret it. But even if I do, it's a hoodie, it's a beanie, it's a poster. I can keep it, I can sell it, I can throw it away. 
but uh, it's not a sometimes literal lifelong investment and lifelong agreement to try and care for this animal. So yeah, we just can't take advantage of impulse and a lot of marketing tactics that people do for different things. And we had to refuse and refund so many people, both intakes and sales. People change their mind, the animal dies before they send it to us, they want their money back. And because we were trying to vet people, making sure they kind of knew what they were doing, uh, I really think that it was fair um, with these standards. I forgot to mention though, me and the other people oftentimes disagreed on which people were good to keep the animal, like to, to take the animal. Uh, so that took a lot of time too on the management side. Like maybe I would think that it's a good owner, someone else would think it's not, or vice versa. It was never one-sided. Sometimes I thought that they were bad and the other person thought they were good. And it was different with different people. It was all subjective, but either way, once we come to an agreement, that was a, a refund. That was another refund. And when somebody gets refused a sale because we flat out say, sorry, we don't believe you're the right fit, they take this very personally because it's completely personal. Like, yeah, no wonder they take it personally. This permanently turns them away. They're never coming back. They're never gonna order. Well, some of them keep reordering because they're angry and try and get it. And then we're just refunding them over and over. But those that don't desperately keep reordering under different names, do we have your credit card information. We can see that fingerprint. We know that you're the same person using a different name or a different email. <laughs> anyway, those that don't do that and try to manipulate us, it lowers the reputation. Who would, who wants to be declined? Uh, mouth to mouth is still like the best way to get clients in general, but you know what is not is mouth to mouth. Don't buy from Emerald Scales. They declined to me. They suck. They're biased, whatever. Mouth to mouth. I couldn't even order through them. Don't waste the time. Go order somewhere else. And at a certain point I was like, why are we even doing this? Like <laughs> there, we decline them and they flat out same day within an hour just go to PetSmart and buy one from there or go order online from somewhere on Morph Market. <laughs> like, I guess we, yes, we were f fulfilling the promise of the individual person that sent the animal that will make sure their animal gets to a good place. But at the end of the day, it's like, they just go and stick a different animal in the setup. So it just, it felt weird sometimes. Like, why are we even bothering? And uh, it wasn't always us willingly giving back people money. Every company deals with chargebacks and bank fraud reports and PayPal cases, but man, did we get a lot of them. Sometimes almost every day it felt like people were charging back their credit card because we took too long to take their animal or um, they're, oh, like if they buy an animal and then we're like, okay, could you answer these questions please? And they just charge back their credit card. This sucks. <laughs> we kept getting our accounts locked. I would like for 30 days, great. Now I can't use PayPal. Now I can't use Stripe. Now I can't accept credit card payments. And I would have to spend literal hours disputing these things so that I don't lose my accounts. And I'd oftentimes lose the disputes and it sucked. Also, we could only sell to adults. Uh, in the USA, you can market and sell to 13 plus year olds in general, of course, depending on what it is. I could sell animals to kids, but I didn't want to. It's That's why most of the animals ended up with us in the first place, is they bought it as a kid, and then they grow up and can't keep it, don't want it, go to college, etc. And so, because a large portion of my audience was under 18, and just a large portion of the internet and people spending money, especially like teens oftentimes have more disposable income than adults because they don't have bills and stuff, but we really couldn't sell to them. And uh, in times that we did like work with younger people, even if it was with their parents permission and everything, it's just not a good idea. And so we had to try and restrict it to adults. Also, we had to accept returns. On the site, we had a, a no return policy. You can't return the animals, but secretly we accepted all returns because if someone contacts us and we're like, they regret it, they, it's not what they expected, they're moving now, they can't keep it. We want to try and fulfill the promise to the person that sent the animal. And so we would take the animal back no matter what it took. Are we covering the expenses? Are we driving six hours to get it? Whatever it takes, we're going to try and fulfill the return so that we can fulfill that original promise. And that made things hard sometimes. And also viewership declined and the trend slowed. And so, so did the sales. Basically over time, yeah, Emerald Scale sales went down and like lockdown stuff and everything, it definitely artificially inflated sales on both ends. A lot of people got their like lockdown pets because they were lonely or whatever. 
pandemic pets, I guess they were called. And we sold many pandemic pets. And then we also took in many pandemic pets. People that lost their job from the lockdowns had to send us their animals. People that moved because of it. People that became depressed and couldn't keep up with the care. And so this was great for us. We had all these intakes coming in and it increased sales because people were buying their pandemic pets. But also the lockdowns are over. <laughs> so sales declined there. Lots of companies had art not even artificial, but they just had inflated sales because of the lockdowns and we did too. So, but it didn't last forever and people ran out of money. <laughs> so yeah, now today people have less money than they did five years ago or three years ago. And that also affected sales and people wouldn't want to answer the questions when we sell them the animal. They buy it online. We send them a very simple list of questions. It became more simplified over time and they just don't want to do it. And it was so frustrating. They're like, I don't have time for this. I'm, why don't you trust me? I'm a perfectly good keeper. Uh, but yeah, they're like, I don't have time. I have a, you know, I have a real job that I need to go. You expect me to answer these three easy questions. What's wrong with you? And so that was a lot of canceled orders as well. And a lot of people, understandably, only wanted to buy if we had medical testing done on the animals. They wanted to see exams for different diseases, diseases and viruses and issues, and they wanted to see blood work. We just flat out, that would have been cool to do with all the animals. We couldn't afford that. Even I, I got discounts. I was actually able to acquire discounts I shouldn't have gotten, like nonprofit discounts. It was still hundreds of dollars for, per animal. And when we're making a profit, I probably should have mentioned, when we're making a profit of $3 an animal, we don't really have that space <laughs> for, we don't really have the margins to get vet testing done. Uh, I mentioned selling shirts and hoodies and stuff. That My margins were like $11 per hoodie. It was more than double for a hoodie than a reptile. And uh, like it was easier to, it took less energy to sell a thousand hoodies than it did to sell 20, 15 reptiles. That was time, kind of a tangent, but whatever. And also we could not sell internationally. I kind of already said that, but we couldn't do it. So that sucked. Also, people believed that we, this was a reputation thing. They felt like they were being ripped off and that we were ripping everyone off because we're listing a, an, an average little leopard gecko, juvenile leopard gecko for 150, 200 bucks. Well, we were just trying to get all the revenue we could because we needed it. This did not sit well with people and it turned people away. And animals develop problems after the fact too. Just because it's fine when we sell it doesn't mean it's gonna be fine forever. It could be something we missed. Generally, I truly don't think it was, or it could be something the new owner did, or it could be just a, an inevitable issue with the animal because it's, it's an animal. And so it, it was like this lifelong warranty almost. Like even the, the last car I bought didn't even come with a warranty. And we had a better warranty than all these extended car warranties. It was like a lifetime of helping them. Still to this day, people email me and I try to help them with animals they bought four or five years ago because I feel like it's an obligation. And um, that took a ton of time helping them with that, with that stuff. And we had as many SKUs as we had animals. <laughs> which is just insane. This, the SKUs are like the, the different options. So um, if you're selling um, like headphones, okay, you've got the black pair and the white pair. That's two SKUs. You're selling shirts. You've got a black shirt and a white shirt. That's two SKUs, but you've got small, medium, and large. So that's four of each. So that's eight SKUs. Every animal is a separate SKU. And so what this meant is like, let's say we have an animal listed and it ends up developing a problem. We can't just, it's not like a shirt defect where you just make another one and send them a new one. This is the individual animal they wanted. Every sale being an individual skew is crazy. Even with a car, it's like, okay, well, we were gonna sell you the blue Toyota, but actually we can't. Now we're gonna sell you the orange one, but I wanted the blue Toyota. Okay, well, are you gonna settle or not? Like, okay, I guess I'll settle for the blue one or the orange or whatever. People don't want to settle for different animals. They get attached before the animal even shows up, which I understand, but it did make things harder. And it made just selling inventory harder in general. Um, we could only do one sale per thing. People would fight over animals for sale and stuff. And this moves into, we never had what the customer wanted. And yeah, people really would fight like, okay, I'll offer you more money, but we don't want to do like a bidding war with this animal. It just felt weird. So we would just do first come first serve. And if they have a poor setup, then we do second come second serve, I guess. And also we actually did try to sell animals as more bundled SKUs. For example, just buying 
a male bearded dragon and we'll just send you a healthy, happy male bearded dragon. But people didn't like that. They wanted to see the specific one they're getting. They wanted to look into its eyes, learn about its personality and get to know it before they even buy. Again, I understand that and it makes sense, but it did make things harder. So let's go to, let's actually go back to when we were starting up. Some mistakes I think that were made there. The first being that it was an LLC and we each had, me and my friend, 50-50 ownership. We each owned 50% of Emerald Scales. Uh, I don't think this is inherently bad, but personally, if I ever start something with someone again, uh, I'm not going to do 50-50. I could see doing a third, third, and third if there's three people doing it, but that's because there's a majority vote. If you have to make a decision, it's best two out of three every time. Uh, there's always that tiebreaker. And so with this, even if it was just 51-49%, or 55-45, or 65-30%, or 75, 25. I don't have to be the bigger number, but I think it is important that one person has more ownership, mostly so that decisions aren't just, because that's why we ultimately ended up splitting up because, and, and I did Emerald Scales like separately, because we couldn't come to an agreement on things and there was no tiebreaker. We were 50-50, we had to come to an agreement or it just fails. And ultimately no one's ever gonna put in 50-50 work. It's always going to be lopsided. You can never totally predict it necessarily. I think you can have a general idea of who's gonna do more. And again, yeah, like I'd be fine being the 35% of a project, but I'm not gonna put in as much work as the person with 65%. Uh, so yeah, that's just something I learned for next time basically. And also neither of us, it was just us two at first, neither could invest all of our time. And this is normal for any sort of startup or whatever. Um, he was in school and I think had a part-time job and I was going all in on YouTube. If we had put in like all of our time and like somehow covered all of our bills and expenses and just focus on normal scales, it could have had a better chance, but that's just part of trying to create something while also sustaining yourself. We also just made some really stupid decisions sometimes. <laughs> We were 17 and then 18 and then 19 and <laughs> and like anyone you're gonna make dumb decisions like one decision that stands out <laughs> is a, a guy wanted to trade with us he had a good setup and everything like it was fine just instead of buying the animal he was gonna pay us with another animal so we go out of our way to go meet up with him he gives us like a corn snake and we give him some lizard i don't remember what it was and i was like okay great have a great day why did we do this? Why did we just trade animals? We just gained nothing. We made no money. We just, we lost one animal, we gained one animal. What was the point of this trade? And so we never did a trade again. It was the dumbest thing ever, but it was like, it was like that. We just make stupid decisions and we learn from them. It sucks learning. It stuck, it sucks make, like, I don't mind making stupid decisions, but it sucks when there's living animals involved that get affected by it. So yeah, it just would have been nice if we didn't make dumb mistakes, but whatever. That's just how it is. We also had disagreements on individual animals, um, similar to how we disagree on who should take the animal or whether we should take the animal, which took a lot. It was, sometimes it was hours of debating over whether we take a single animal or not uh, because of the condition it's in and stuff. <clears throat> but also once the animal was here, like it has, it has like say a surfaced wound, it got scratched or something. Is this wound bad enough to warrant a vet visit? Um, ideally we would say yes to all of them, but we have limited resources and we have to be smart with the resources. And so we would disagree. Again, this was not one-sided. It wasn't always me saying yes vet and him saying no vet or vice versa. It was a mix. Every, every case was individual and <laughs> it's annoying having to do like, sometimes one of us would do something out of pocket because we really feel like it was necessary. And uh, with the care as well, what in, what size enclosure, what substrate, just even little things. What should this be eating? How often should it be eating? What size? Lots of just subjective disagreements. Again, we had the same goal, which was great and useful. We wanted the same thing, which was to do the best we can for the animal while being efficient with the resources. But those levels of efficiency versus like the best we can do, you have to cut it off somewhere. I know some people say there is no cutoff. You have to do everything for the animal, but it's like, okay, the animal seems to have a respiratory problem. Are we going to bring it to the vet? If yes, like, okay, are we gonna get the exam done? Are we gonna get an x-ray done? Are we gonna get blood work done? Are we gonna get this other test done? You can go on forever and dump thousands of dollars into an animal and the vets will take the money for sure. And uh, so you have to cut it off somewhere and that made things hard too and just more stressful. I wonder how many times I've said the word stressful in this video. And also we were making a product and service-based company at the same time. For the first time, 
with live animals. We were 17 year olds who had never created a business, who had never sold much of anything. Now we're going to do a service and a pr the intakes and a product, the sales, at the same time with living animals. What a great idea. If I could go back, one of us I think should have focused 90% on product and one should be 90% service. And then we commingle sometimes instead of both trying to do both. But man, was that difficult trying to do two totally different strategies at the same time with living animals. I can't get over that. We tried to do that. <laughs> we tried to expand multiple times, many times. And this was by finding partners. Now, early on, we actually had this idea. Our original idea was we're going to start by breeding ball pythons. And then we find other breeders who sell through us, like reputable breeders that, that we market and sell for. We ended up doing this not with breeding, but with what Emerald Scales was doing, where we would find partners who were willing to take animals the same way we do, and they do the care that we use up their space, and then they ship the animal to the new person. The difference is we, oh, oh and then we pay them for it. Uh, we would pay them 65% of the revenue, <clears throat> which ultimately just wasn't that much. <laughs> so for the past few months, Emerald Scales has been selling the animals that we get in, and then we rehab or make sure they're all good and then sell them again. But now we want to open up an opportunity for other people that might be interested in selling their own animals on a new platform with us. So obviously for the safety of our buyers and anyone that's interested, we're gonna be pretty strict with these applications and really kind of dig deep to make sure that everyone uh, is being genuine and like a good person to work with. And the more variety we get, the, har the larger our platform and audience will get hopefully. So that's why this is that's why it's beneficial for you because you're reaching an audience that you would never otherwise reach for. They had to spend as much as we were on everything and they got less money than we did. So it didn't make much sense for them to do because it wasn't profitable for them either, believe it or not. Uh, but we needed that 35% to cover the shipping supplies, the marketing uh, that we were doing and we would handle the customer support so we had to pay for the customer service and everything it was also very hard to find reliable people like at the time we're young <clears throat> we have peers that want to do it with us and it's hard to see who's really going to be dedicated because we never met any of these people in person they were in different states and that was good because this is how we got around the laws <laughs> That sounds kind of bad. If there was an animal that we could not take in North Carolina, we could have it sent to one of our partners, like the animals in California, we're in North Carolina, the animal is illegal in North Carolina. So we have it shipped from North Carolina to someone we work with in Virginia. That person does everything and then we sell it to someone in, I don't know, back to California. It never touches North Carolina, so it was never illegal, but we were still the ones kind of working with it. So that was the one of the other benefits of this. But yeah, it was hard to find people and people got very flaky uh, with this. A, they probably realized how hard it is and what a pain it is and how it looks fun, but isn't actually fun at all. And B, we had people list it, like we ship them an animal, we list it on our site, and then they end up being like, actually, I'm gonna keep it. <laughs> like what you can't do that and they're like well i'm going to it's like well we didn't <laughs> we didn't really <laughs> okay <laughs> we probably could have done some legal like agreement where they can't keep it but we also had people um we'd sell an animal and then they sell it to someone else uh this was luckily someone not selling our animal but animals that they had that they were going to sell through us we'd sell it and then they sell it before they ship with us and then it's like what we have to cancel on the other person and that sucks and uh this is how we sent a wrong animal the one time we sent an incorrect animal was one of these partners that did it but of course this reflects on the entirety of emerald scales and to this day one of the reputations of emerald scales is we ship animals to the wrong people <laughs> or ship the wrong animals to people it was one time and it wasn't even us but it was still it is our responsibility we couldn't have done anything about it but yeah, it, less quality control basically. Also, breeders never came through. Like we were gonna work with breeders, they just simply never came through. They never started breeding, they realized it was harder, they didn't have the money. It's just people that are like, yeah, this is cool, I'll do it. They seem really cool and they just don't do it. And finally, for this section, customers hated when they found out about this. We weren't keeping it a secret, but if they saw that their animal was going to a different state and not me, directly they were so angry they were like what are you you're misleading us this is not what we asked for we wanted it to go to you and they hated when they learned it didn't come from me i wasn't the one that packed it it came from someone else in another state this isn't emerald scales what is this this is a scam 
in my opinion, it was, um, they were just as good as I was, unless they sent you the wrong animal, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, 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 it was a cool idea, but it just was not working out well, and it needed a lot more, we needed to, I don't know, it, it was in the right direction, but it didn't work out, basically, so, distribution, failed. Okay, one more section, and then I'll get to all my personal reasons <clears throat> that I stopped it. Let's talk about alternate means of income that we tried. Uh, a lot of companies will, th their main product doesn't actually make the money, it's something else that makes the money. Like whether it's add-ons to the product or a different service or whatever, or maintenance on it, like car uh, salesmen make more money on the maintenance of the car than actually selling the car. And so we had ideas too, like boarding reptiles. If you're going to the on a vacation, if you're going to the military, if you're going to school for a semester, we almost many times almost did reptile boarding where you could bring it to us or ship it to us. I'm so, I'm so glad we didn't do this. It would have been horrible. Like just imagine the condition the animals would come in and we have to give them back legally, like, but we wouldn't want to. And then if people are going to abandon them with us all the time, because many of the animals we got were just abandoned with the people that sent them to us. Like, hey, I'm going to the beach. Could you watch my reptile? Yeah, no problem. They never come back. <laughs> and that's what they would have done with us. And it would have been like, yeah, legally we could have kept it and then sold it and stuff. But imagine then they do come back and they're like, where's my reptile? It would be like the worst aspects of a pawn shop. <laughs> like imagine the arguments and anger people would have if we sold their animal because they took too long. Plus, yeah, like different issues the animals got had and everything. It would have been horrendous. So glad we didn't do that. Breeding reptiles, we never did. I just lost, to I totally lost passion for breeding. I like didn't even want to bring new animals into the, f I didn't want to make new an reptiles exist. We did breed amphibians, we bred axolotls and that went pretty well. It's just, it took a lot of time. It took energy away from the main thing and it just never really went anywhere. Um, and breeding reptiles sucks, I don't like it. So breeding feeder insects is a little different. We bred some here and there, but never sold them just for our sell, well, for the animals to eat. And breeding feeders to sell, it's just a whole big separate business. That would have been a whole third branch of living animals because the bugs are living. Even if it doesn't matter if they die as much, it's still gonna be a pain. And we experienced that when we bred invertebrates because we actually did do this. Different like roaches and um, millipedes and I forgot what else, but it was, it was cool actually. It was ite. Uh, I didn't mind having them around. I didn't care about invertebrates at all. The problem was it was another living animal that we were shipping, not overnight, but two to three day delivery because it's cheaper and nobody wants to pay $60 for a roach, like a pet roach. <laughs> but they would also be dead on arrivals, uh, especially the isopod or uh, yes. Yeah, oh, springtails and isopods. I forgot we sold those. Um, but they would be dead on arrival too, sometimes, not always, but we'd have to reship and that would get expensive. And we just weren't that good at breeding and selling invertebrates. It was something we would have had to practice and work on and invest time into, and it was expensive and it actually never profited. I lost money on breeding invertebrates because of this. And so maybe it could have worked in the long term, but it just, we didn't have the resources there. However, one thing that did actually profit was, um, product sales, some original products. It was actually kind of drop shipping, but kind of not. I mean, we would just get, um, like we sold isopod starter kits, basically, and isopod breeder kits, and they were pretty cool. Uh, and we would drop ship the different parts and put it all together and sell it as a kit, and people liked them. Uh, this is something we would have continued doing if I continued Emerald Scales. It was like one alternate means that actually worked. We just didn't scale it up enough. Haha, <laughs> Emerald Scales, scale. I said scale. And then there's donations. Uh, we didn't want to accept donations because it was not a nonprofit. We didn't want to confuse people. And there were times where like someone meets us, gives us an animal in person, and they give us, like some people would give us like $100 in cash as like a thank you. Uh, but we didn't want to like officially accept donations because it would have not it helped. It wouldn't have been in the right direction. It, it couldn't be donation based. It would, have, would not have been right for Emerald Scales, which I also talked about in that other video, so. Well, it's in the description. I don't know why I pointed up. Finally, something we put a little bit of consideration into was paid events, like the whole birthday thing, sort of like, oh, reptiles at your birthday, at your kid's birthday. Uh, I this is a possibility because I used to do events with reptiles and stuff, uh, not for money, just for fun and also for uh, exposure to uh, go herping or at the time NC Nature News. But I just didn't want to do this. There was extra work. <laughs> We didn't have time for this, it never happened. So those are the alternate means of income. And finally, 
my personal reasons of why Emerald Scales does not exist anymore. I became jaded. That's it. What is jade? Like, I feel like jaded is such a good word. Haha, <laughs> jade, emerald. My name is Alex Green. Alex Green got jaded doing emerald scales. Oh, yeah. Um, jaded, tired, bored, or lacking enthusiasm, typically after having too much of something. Wow, that is perfect. Yeah, that's it. That's 100% it. I became jaded. That's the whole reason emerald scales doesn't, doesn't exist now. I lost motivation. I lost direction. I couldn't care anymore. I lost the ability to care, which is not good when you're working with animals. So I stopped working with animals. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I bit off way more than I could chew, and the stress became too much. How many times did I say stress in this video? I don't know, but every time I said it, it was multiplying it by a factor of 10, and I physically just couldn't handle the stress. Maybe you could, but I couldn't do it. I have a very high stress tolerance now, so that's cool. But yeah, I also, yeah, I bit off more than I could chew. I should have taken fewer animals. I should have slowed down. But at the same time, I wanted to hit that five-year goal. I didn't want to drag this on for 10 or 15 years if it wasn't getting anywhere, really. And uh, plus, we had to kind of rapidly work because relevancy on YouTube is temporary. And the eye, we had to take advantage of those eyeballs on us. Um, but I still bit off more than I could chew there. I also grew to hate people, just in general. It was kind of sad. <laughs> Everyone around me physically, the people I was working with, we wouldn't get along all the time. Uh, it would get stressful. We would fight and, and bicker and get in arguments and disagree and stop working together uh, with like my friends, employees, everything. The people physically around my house, the neighbors, the people in the neighborhood, the person on the townhouse to my left, the person on the townhouse to my right. People around me didn't like me. They hated me. I grew to hate them. People online. Many of the customers were great. And there's so many good things about Emerald Scales, but this is focused on why it failed. Uh, many great people online. Not everyone was, though. And I tend to focus on the negative because I'm a person. That's just how people work. And lots of negativity online around it. Lots of angry customers. Lots of, of angry intake people. And I, I really started to resent people keeping reptiles because all of my day was seeing these animals come in and seeing these emails come in with these neglected animals. And it made me really hate people in general. Uh, getting taken advantage of by all sorts of people. I grew to hate people and that was not healthy. I'm a lot better now. I don't hate people now. <laughs> I hate maybe a couple people, but uh, it's it's much better now. But yeah, those terrible people overshadowed everything. So also, I had no personal space. I lived in okay. There's the townhouse. There's two bedrooms. There's a living room, dining room, and kitchen. Everything was animals. Everything was emerald scales except for one bedroom, which had some personal animals, and our office. We lived in the office, so it was a bed two desks for the office where all the work was done that wasn't animals everything else was animals and there was zero personal space and this really made there was work-life balance was not a thing there was no life I had no life none of us had any life all of our lives was work and the work was becoming increasingly unfulfilling not fun hated it started hating the clients and we weren't making money we were getting Though, like everyone I was working with, we're getting paid nine to 15 an hour. I wasn't making money on Emerald Scales. It was not fun. <laughs> also, I don't enjoy animal husbandry anymore. Like that was a big part of it. I didn't enjoy cleaning enclosures. I didn't enjoy making enclosures. I didn't enjoy, um, I didn't enjoy the husbandry. <laughs> That's a big part of Emerald Scales though. And yeah, I had no personal life at all. This was my life and this, is totally fine. If I have another project I do, I will do the same thing where I dedicate every second of my life to it. Everything will revolve around it. And this is why I think it's important to put a time frame on it and not not necessarily stick to it, but be reasonable. Like gr concept of grinding. Um, I like it, but you can't do it forever. It's not a lifelong thing. The idea behind like hustle culture actual hustle culture. I really like real hustle culture. And to me, the real hustle culture is you hustle for short durations of time to get a ton done, to get to a spot that you want, and then you can chill. You can't hustle your whole life. And so we didn't. We did for five years. I did for five years. Many people did for five years for this. Couldn't do it. It didn't work. It was it was not working. And I feel like, uh, yeah, the a lot of the best years of my personal relationships were kind of ruined by this. Again, this was my own fault. I put myself in this position. I can't blame anyone else. 
but um, I was not a fun person to be around. I wouldn't have wanted to be around me. I had a short temper. I was stressed out. I was super anxious. I was getting really sad. I was frustrated. I didn't know how to work with people. I was not even enjoying the work. I was starting to resent the people and the animals that I was working with. And I lost my passion for working with animals. <laughs> I can safely say that I will never professionally work with animals again in my, the rest of my life. I will die before I make money on an animal project again. I'll do stuff as a hobbyist. I made a video then as well. I, I kind of sugarcoated it, but I started rehoming my personal animals over three years ago, and I finally admitted it. Um, and it felt good. I felt like I was doing the right thing because I, I, I didn't have that personal um, passion that I did at one point, and it just didn't feel right for to keep some. Plus, I just didn't want to keep some, and I just, I lost the love for them that I had. I didn't know what happened, but it did, and I can't deny it. This was partly just general burnout and overworking myself, but also, um, I don't like, I feel bad saying this. Obviously, a lot of you watching keep reptiles and stuff. I don't want to discredit the love for your reptiles, but I just want to be honest about this and get it out there. Uh, I realized that reptiles <laughs> are a lot less personable than I thought. Person, yeah, personable, I guess. It hit me, I don't know, it hit me when we started getting animals that were exact, exact, 100% identical clones of my own pets. It's like, wow, this ball python, it's, it, it's a clone, it's a duplicate of mine. And I just, I over-personified them, I guess. I, oh, I, put, I put too much, um, I was unrealistic about the, the personalities and the individuality, and there doesn't need to be individuality to enjoy something like, I mean, I love cars. I don't, I drive one of the most common cars now. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're all duplicates. They're all exact duplicates. You could put me in any of them. I can't tell which one it is. It's not bad to like something just because it's, it has a duplicate out there. It just hit me kind of hard realizing that a lot of these animals just like, wow, they really do. They just want to survive. They don't care about me. They don't care about anything. They just, their little, little tiny brains are just surviving. They just exist. I'm just projecting onto them. I'm just personifying them. And I had a good little existential crisis over that. And it didn't help my already loss of passion and everything. I think everyone could agree. If I am not passionate about working with the animals, if I become jaded, I shouldn't be working with the animals. So I stopped working with the animals. What I can say, I'm really happy to say this, I really love the animals that I do have now. Uh, it feels good to actually love my chickens. My, I'm aware my chickens don't really care about me. They're also duplicates of each other, but I accept that and I'm okay with that. And I still love them. I almost rehomed my cat, Shiro. Is he in the shot? Yeah, I don't know where he is, but I got very close to rehoming my cat. I lost the love for him. I didn't care about him anymore because I couldn't care about anything. I, I lost the ability to care and uh, I'm glad I didn't rehome him because now I really love my cat. So that's nice to be able to say genuinely, I'm not faking it anymore. Uh, there was lots of faking it. <laughs> and there was lots of just faking my care and my love for things. Um, funnily, I feel like I didn't really fake it in videos. I was very, I, I guess people thought I was playing a character by like how much I was resenting some animals and how much I disliked some species and how much I seemed to not care. And like, I guess people thought it was like a comedy bit. I was aware that there was entertainment there, but that was real. That was genuine. I was sugarcoating it for sure. I was even more negative in my mind than I came off on camera. So I, it's not everyone noticed, but yeah, I was, <laughs> if you watch through, I feel like you can kind of tell that I'm tapering off. I'm looking more tired and I have less energy and I, and finally, I just simply ran out of time. I didn't want to give this more than five years. If I couldn't make it realistically self-sustainable in five years, I was going to be done. And I'm totally fine moving goalposts, but I didn't want to move it this time. I thought it was a good goal and five years passed. So I stopped Emerald Scales. And uh, that is 100 reasons why Emerald Scales failed and is no more. God, this took forever to film. So again, I want to be clear. <clears throat> good things came out of it, but this is focused on the bad. This is the point of the video. You can see lots of the good in the unboxing videos and in the vlogs and in the different uh, transformations of the animals. There was plenty of good there. Many animals were helped. Many people were helped. I had many great experiences. I had fun times. I met interesting people. Good stuff came out of it. I was. It helped my YouTube channel a ton, which is my main career, and I'm really grateful for that. And the, the far majority of the viewers are great. Those of you watching, I really loved reading the comments and interacting with you and meeting people through it all. But 
that's not what this video is about. This is about why I failed. So just to be clear, there was positives. It wasn't all negative, but the negative ultimately outweighed the positive. And so that's that. Yeah, Emerald Scales is not coming back. I no longer sell animals. I'll, I no longer take animals. Uh, so if you want to send me something, sorry, I'm, I probably won't even respond realistically. Uh, I no longer have any employees or anything, so it's just me right now, so I can't respond to anything. Everything anyway, it's done. What a relief. What a freedom that came along with it. Uh, I should have, I, I, I kind of, there's no reason to regret, I guess, but I kind of wish I ended it sooner. I guess I thought if I really stuck it out for a few more years that, oh, we could figure something out. We could make it work, but no. Yeah, I, I'll never do it again. <laughs> However, I'm happy to say I didn't totally lose my passion for animals because it has come back. I really, like I said, it's it's nice to feel care. <laughs> and also, um, I haven't lost my passion for projects in general. I'm not doing much right now. I'm just kind of making money and existing. Um, I'm doing videos, I'm doing Uber, I'm doing some Amazon. I do plan on starting more stuff in my life and probably within the next year or so, probably sooner, within a few months actually, um, if I can get the money together for it but it'll not be emerald scales so yeah shout out to everyone that supported emerald scales throughout the years or my videos or whatever um i appreciate it and that's that's it on Ooh, what a video sorry it was so negative but it just being honest i guess you can check the description for more hopefully you enjoyed or learned something um <laughs> but that'll be it i guess i don't know i'm alex and thanks for watching